Good morning, LinkedIn family. It is Thursday. It is not 1030 Eastern. There's a reason for that. It involves uh, some Einstein equations, a solar flare, and probably the space-time continuum. With that, I'm Jeremy Gilbertson. I'm one of the co-hosts of Thinking on Paper. As always with me is Mr. Fielding. Mark, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, thank you. I wish I could say I'd had an extra hour's sleep last night because of uh, our delay, but I didn't. So yeah, apologies for our American friends. Daylight savings got us. Got us good, got us good today. Uh, but we're here, that's the important thing. Thanks for joining us. Looking forward to a lively discussion with a very interesting individual. Mark, if you want to introduce our guest and we'll uh, we'll jump right in. Yeah, so um, our guest today is Leo Nascau. And um, somebody who I, I wish I was as smart and as good at writing as Leo is when I was in my 20s because um, I wasn't <laughs> and I'm not sure I still am. Um, Leo, I'll let him explain in more detail what he does, but he, he works for culture three which is a media magazine and i'll quote the website to get a better so you get a better idea of what culture three is so artists builders and communities are redefining the future as we know it culture three explores how they are fulfilling the cultural promise of the internet we exhibit the creativity of web3 artistry the use cases developed by web3 builders and the communities augmented by and built on blockchain now if that doesn't sound interesting then i don't know what is um when i first met leo i think he was doing most things for culture three curating editing hr writing i think your role has been more well i'll let you explain ladies and gentlemen leo mascow thank you so much that's a very kind intro um but yeah no that really captures what we're trying to do at culture three we sort of see where we are in 2023 it's a really pivotal moment in terms of what the internet looks like what how society organizes and really blockchain is just a fundamentally innovative and really impactful uh technology that we want to sort of bring to the world and think about what it means for culture what it means for commerce what it means for for people organizing and we do that really with with media through articles podcasts just like these um you've got wonderful writers so it makes my job of editing very easy um wonderful writers like mark and yeah that's really the vision to sort of show the world we've got this really exciting technology this is what it actually means for for you for you for your friends for your job this is why we think it's really important yeah it's yeah. amazing what i what i tend to think too because I, I i love emerging tech but i also love what's what uh, helping people understand the, the 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 foundational principles, like pulling pulling the thread back a little bit to to understand the application of it, right? And uh, that's what I love trying to do. And I, and I, I have a sense that that's what you guys are trying to do as as well, because it's a great capability that this this technology has. But there's a lot of a lot of smoke and mirrors, a lot of uh, a lot of um, a lot of buzz in the wrong way, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the tech is what it is. And, you know, the application of the tech is always the interesting piece, right? Yeah, for sure. The reason we call it culture three, rather than like tech three, or even like something web three, something sort of maybe that might have been a bit nerdier is because I think what people are really interested in is what the impact of that actually is. A couple of months ago in December, A16Z's Andreessen Horowitz, the big investment fund, shut down. They had a magazine called Future Mag, which was kind of trying to do a similar thing, trying to get people excited about technology. But it was really focused on the tech and quite intricate subjects that aren't going to really energize people. That's And they shut down. And it sort of, at least to me, felt like we've validated the way that we've tried to approach things, which is by focusing on the culture, thinking about what does this mean for arts? What does it mean for people and telling the stories of the impact that it can have rather than just what it is and letting I don't know people try and figure it out for themselves or other letting other people sort of make the conversation less interesting, really trying to elevate the interesting stories. How would you how would you define culture? Yeah, we think of it really broadly because um, you can just say arts and culture and people sort of think of pictures film music but i think it's much broader than that it's also fundamentally it's about our values what we think is interesting what we elevate in society where status comes from sort of 
we have it, it starts with things like what we see in films and things like i saw hamilton um last night and one of the big themes in that is that you should really stick strong to your beliefs and culture isn't just hamilton the film it's also what narratives we have what we think is important and that's that kind of filters through into what we are publishing about we want to have a really broad scope and think about what culture is it's not just what you see in tv it's also really informs the way the way that we think and interact with other people as well yeah good definition language storytelling yeah it's almost like this this collective narrative that's kind of emergent in nature and everyone kind of feeds it and it self-regulates in a way right like it's it's like its own organism uh it's it's pretty cool when you think of cult it's a, it's a big question to think about like what is culture right and and um it's individual perspectives into a collected perspective based on values based on um you know where you come from all that really interesting man the ingredients that separates us from the animals no i mean i really that conscious culture language storytelling behaviors beliefs religions that kind of augment the human condition yeah yeah what i think it is it's is it's a way of telling stories to to the people that come after us and having that 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 communication almost between generations and between different groups of people that animals have to a much lesser extent, I think, is that communication between different groups. What about, um, I always like asking this question at the start, what about, uh, what about your background? Maybe not, give me like two or three stops on, on the journey that, uh, that fed most to what you're doing today with, with culture three and emerging tech. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think before Culture Three, I was I was doing such a boring job. Um, it's about it's almost the year to the day since I quit, and we did Culture Three. Um, but I was doing, uh, I think that the technical term, the McKinsey term, is leadership advisory, which is basically about helping CEOs become better. And I really enjoyed it for about a year, twelve months. I was there. Um, you met loads of really interesting people. You learned a lot about how people lead and how people enact change in their organizations. Um, I kind of found it quite boring because it was sort of the same thing over and over again. It was a bit sort of being someone on the production line. But in terms of having that insight into how change actually happens within an organization, I found it really interesting. And before that, I did lots of content stuff, really, um, sort of running magazines and things like that. And that's obviously fed into what we're trying to do at Culture 3 as well. That's been useful, too. Nice. <laughs> yeah, um, so... I want to speak about the, I know that you did a, a, a report recently, recently on charity and Web3, mm. but before we get to that, um, so if everyone doesn't know, I, I do do some writing for Culture3, and when I'm, I focus on Film3, and one of the questions that I always try to kind of take with me into this is something that you said, Leo, when we first met about Culture3, and kind of why why web3 like what is web3 doing to make that the the particular art form so for me it's cinema better or more open like what is it about web3 that doesn't exist elsewhere that is making the creativity and the the process better and i know so i focus on film three but you you cover music film fashion art i know there's a lot of technical stuff which of those do you think is best geared up to to use Web3 for big, wide success? Is it is it cinema? Is it music? Is it art? Is it fashion? Is it any of the other things that you cover? And why do you think that is? Mm, it's a really interesting question. I think I think two sorts of areas worth thinking about uh, art, sort of digital art, and there's an interesting area in commerce as well. I, my, um, we're all founded, Culture 3 is also co-founded by Misson Harriman, who's chair of the South Bank Center in the UK. And he pinged me, pinged me someone on the Substack, which was talking about art as digital art as the next trillion dollar asset class, which is a huge number. The like the securities market in the world is worth $13 trillion and the art market is worth 40 billion. So digital art is gonna be a trillion dollar market. That would be huge. Um, I think that's optimistic, but art is really interesting from a Web3 perspective for, I think, three main reasons. First is it, it just makes digital art something that you can prove the authenticity of, of 
in a way that you couldn't before. It, so it means, you know, because you have an NFT and you can see who made it. And if you copy and paste it, then you, you know, sort of one is a fake. That's not so relevant for music. Music already made that transition into the digital age, sort of everyone's Apple Music, Spotify, and film. There's so much sort of the connections between having a director and getting into a cinema or getting onto Netflix. You can't just like copy and paste that. But with art, you really can. And so having an NFT makes digital art something that's really something that you're able to do and monetize in a way that you couldn't do before. And the other two reasons why art is really interesting in Web3 is because by having a direct connection and by being able to sell that NFT representing some digital artwork to your collectors without having to go through a Sotheby's or something is so powerful because before what you had to do was know some people in Mayfair, know some people in New York. What you can do now is directly reach your collectors and your community online. Mostly that's happening through Twitter, but the principle is you can do it anywhere with an internet connection and you can sell things directly to them. So what we've, some of the really inspiring artists that we've covered with Culture3, um, one woman called Joanna, uh, her handle is Serene Obscurity on Twitter, and she lives in a cult in Western India. And it's a really difficult situation for her. This is a cult where you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to drink sort of your, you're watched all of the time. There's dancing is regulated. You're not meant to have spend too much time on your phone and things like that. It's a very oppressive context. And she uses our art as an outlet and she's able to make a career out of it. Thanks to NFTs, she's never going to, she, she might never go to New York, might never meet anyone in London, but she's able to be an artist. And that's such a powerful thing that Web3 is uniquely made possible. And the third reason is that whoever you are, by having that direct connection to collectors, you can do whatever you want. The other class of, well, one other type of creator that we cover quite a lot is just people who are really good, people who have done stuff with Netflix, with Nickelodeon, with Disney. Um, but they have to do what the CEO of Disney wants or whatever. And they're really talented. They find an audience in Web3 and they can do really random stuff that they were never able to do in Disney, but they can do in Web3. And so there's loads of really interesting reasons why art is something that is worth getting excited about in terms of what digital art means. Not sure whether it will, whether it will become a trillion dollar asset class, but I think the 40 billion mark of what traditional art is, is certainly within sight. The other section that I think is probably under discussed is um, just that idea of commerce more broadly. I think we've done a couple of articles like, on a company called Day Away, which is sort of luxury travel. And you can basically log in to loads of different sites and get discounts with your NFT. And the other interesting one is Starbucks's program. And the idea is that some of your transactions are on the blockchain. Anyone can drop perks to that sort of thing, can drop discounts, and you are sort of interconnected in a much deeper way. It's like sort of if you could log into Starbucks with your Amazon Prime account, or anyone could give you a discount based on you holding a particular NFT. Um, this sort of thing happens in the real life. Like right now you can use your Starbucks reward stuff to book airline flights, but it's really difficult to organize. It's cumbersome to organize and you have to go through Starbucks to do it by having these things as an NFT well, not as an NFT when your transactions are on the blockchain and can be read, there's sort of, there are privacy elements to be discussed, but when all of, when some of that is public, you can do so much more interesting stuff just in terms of commerce, in terms of selling things, in terms of branding, promotions, discounts. That's something that I'm really excited to see develop over the coming years, as well as art. Go, Jeremy. Unpack yeah. that. Did you, did you see my <laughs> see my wheels turning? Um, well, no, well, yeah. So, Leo, your perspective is super interesting to me because you see a lot going on from multiple facets. You have the different categories, you have the emerging tech underline, and you're seeing what people are doing in interesting ways. So the way I look at what happened in this first round of, of Web3, not just, not just the rug pulls and all the nonsense, mm -hmm. but also like people putting projects out there that were just more experiments, more like, let's see what this thing can do. 
uh, rather than let's come up with a concrete way to generate value uh, in an exchange between someone making something and someone buying something or someone using something, right? Um, so what I would like to know is, you know, the, the the key balance to me is is how easy is this stuff to use, interact with, and if it's not that easy, is is the value on the other side of the equation of using it more than you would get in a traditional use case? So, for example, like, is it a deeper connection to something? Does it give you access to something that you couldn't get by being on an email list? So, who is doing things really well? to simplify the activation of a relationship in Web3? I think the main thing that needs a bit of work is, like this is obviously a user experience question, but that's almost become one of those buzzwords and we need to be specific, I think, about what we actually mean and which steps we're focusing on when we talk about user experience. I think making it um, easier and safer just for people to hold NFTs and to buy them um is a really important thing and i think a lot of that is going to come with people not holding their own wallets and things like that i think that's probably an unoriginal people have probably heard that perspective before but i think it's important um and i think the other thing that maybe gets talked about less often is making it easy for businesses to really use on-chain data and to to manage their community and to sort of have insights and to understand their community. Um, and so there are organized, there are some startups doing this. There's a bunch of different companies. Um, like one that comes to mind is called Chasm, K-A-Z-M. Basically sort of like a CRM for your for your Web3 community. There's, yeah, there's definitely other companies available uh, as well as Chasm. But that idea of having sort of insight into your community and what they're doing on chain, I think is really important for, for unlocking a lot of the value for businesses as well. If businesses start to come, that value will also be, be generated for consumers and customers and users as well. Yeah, that kind of ties into like the identity side of this thing, right? So to participate mm -hmm. in this new economy, this new way of interacting, we have to be something digital too, right? So you have this ability and there are companies doing this right now. You have this ability to be, have your identity, but also have these different personas that you can open data flow to other entities, right? So I may not want persona, my persona A to, to be in work mode or whatever. And persona B is more friends and whatever. And, you know, so there are ways to kind of segment these data categories. Are you seeing anything on that side, any innovation on that side in the community related to kind of a self-sovereign identity and personas? I think it's a really interesting topic. The stuff I've seen has, at least so far, has been just people individually experimenting with it. I had, um, I think it was last year actually, I had Ben Mayer White on the Culture 3 podcast. And his the, the main thing that we talked about there was how he brought Adidas into the into into the metaverse um, with their partnership with the Board Ape Yacht Club, um, and on, on the call it wasn't sort of him, well it was him I was speaking to, but he manifested as this mutant ape, which he had somehow got like a three D model of, and this is the thing that he uses to go to Adidas meetings, he does it on other podcasts. This is his like digital persona. Um, which I think is, is quite a fun use case. A lot of people have taken that a step further and have started really building their sort of their their pseudonym around it, which I think is, I mean, it's definitely untraditional. I've definitely heard of people getting laughed out of boardrooms when they say, I've got a 24 by 24 pixel image as my Twitter profile and like that. Um, and I think I think a lot of people have also been realizing that you do need some video content to really engage people and to have a connection. So I'm not sure how far it's going to play out. And I think, and potentially that's why it's really only been individuals really experimenting with that identity question to the furthest extent rather than startups. It's like an extension of the PFP, isn't it? I remember a few yeah. months ago, pe people were... On, on LinkedIn and Twitter, there was this row about, oh, okay, you don't have your PFP on LinkedIn, then you're not really, you're not really in this, okay, you're not committed or whatever. And um, I think that it, like you say, perhaps 
it's almost like people experimenting in video games where they go out of the game. So you have these PFPs and they work on Twitter, but okay, there's some people taking them and experimenting with them in the boardroom. And yes, you say they get left left out of town and most times they'll get left out of town, but perhaps they'll all gravitate towards their communities again where other people come in and then they don't get left out of town. I think it's, uh, we, we spoke about this with Sam Simmons, if you remember, Jeremy, because he's a mm-hmm. crypto punk and he used his punk. And I think that's a valid question as well, because if you're an ape or a punk, then okay, you've got some clout behind your digital um persona but if you're from a lesser collection you don't yeah it's it, it, it's interesting i was involved in an early experiment with with iheart i was a producer on a podcast uh called prop culture and we partnered with um we partnered with um uh, the adult swim team comedy team uh they're kind of a, a turner offshoot and based out of atlanta super funny guys but iheart procured a bunch of different nfts a couple of doodles one from loot for adventurers and we created these characters and they would basically run down pop culture events and make bets make prop bets <laughs> on what's happening but they created these characters out of the out of the pfps which i think is super interesting i mean we're seeing a lot of other people do that more so now uh in 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 episodic content even um but it's like a trigger it's a start a seed a seed of of what could come from a piece of ip right yeah the other thing to to bear in mind sort of like when you have it your ape is your profile picture is that as well as it giving you you clout you're also sort of becoming you're becoming becoming part of that community is a double-edged sword you're getting some clout from it but also if things take a turn for the worse your reputation is built on you being identified by that that image and apes have done pretty well so far um but we've seen plenty of other collections uh not sort of last the distance and there's no guarantee that apes is going to be around in five years i mean sort of you'd be if you'd be sitting <coughs> against it and there's a big opportunity cost to betting against it but there are no guarantees in web3 and so when you're thinking about something as permanent as identity I think I think you have to be careful to to be to make choices that you're going to be comfortable with for a long time. Yeah, it's kind of like when you have that group of group of buddies you associate with in in <laughs> middle school, and and all of a sudden you know the teacher is a buddy with one of the parents, and then they pull you aside and be like, hey, you know, Jeremy's hanging around with this crowd; they're doing some stuff. You may want to. I don't know. It's it's all of this stuff is first. What are they doing? Right? What are they doing, Jeremy? I can't tell you that on this. This is a it's a family show, Mark. It's a family show. PG thirteen. PG thirteen. Yeah. XR rated. Um, just going back to what you were saying about the kind of cross pollination of brands and with everything being public on the blockchain. So if a if a brand a new i don't know like a new drinks brand wants to associate themselves let's not use drinks that's too boring let's say a new a new virtual fashion brand wants to associate themselves with um an nft collection they could do airdrops to everyone who owns a um a clonex for example and they Mm -hmm. kind of get build on that but also i know that there's a few writers experimenting with that is any of the artists that you've covered are they exploring ways to take air dropping and kind of piggybacking on other communities to the next le- level have you seen any of that kind of done successfully i think the main example that comes to mind is storyverse which you know pretty well um what storyverse is is founded by justin waldron who co-founded zynga um which is pretty big big for him um and he knows basically sort of yeah gaming is his big thing but he's thinking a couple of years ago how he's looking at generative art and art blocks and thinking how can i make something like this for writers and the idea is to essentially create comic book episodes that where the choices that you make affect this, the narrative and how that develops i think i've explained that sort of decent i'm not sure if i've explained that badly or not but basically yeah, yeah, you that's, make choices that's, that's about right yeah and then how your narrative how the narrative evolves and what the story looks like um becomes becomes interesting and the other key point is that sort of your nft sort of gets adapted and it becomes like a collectible um 
and then so what you're doing there and so the idea is to so, so mint everyone can mint like a free nft which is the first episode of the comic and then by episode 20 or season three you've got some unique stuff and some of these are more valuable than others based on how the narrative has gone based on the market whatever and you can do really interesting things there because i mean you can also integrate sort of whatever you want fashion drinks you can integrate that into the story and maybe your nft can take on certain characteristics and you can also airdrop stuff to people that have a certain type of that comic book nft people that have made certain choices um and those sorts of things like fundamentally it's just bringing choices on to the blockchain i think are really interesting like there's definitely lots of opportunities to to innovate around that in all sorts of areas in all sorts of verticals story versus just one doing it for writing but i think it could go a lot further yeah, Mark, and you 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 have some experience working with Storyverse, right? How has that been so far? Oh, it's very new, but um, it's 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 a lot of fun for me as a writer, um, just because. I, and this kind of harks back to what Leo was saying about the people, the real writers who are working for Disney, and they get to come here and just go go nuts and write <laughs> all their, their their dream stories. And for me, for me, it's it's very early, but it's a good. Um, excuse to do that it's a lot of it's a lot of fun it's very dialogue based so there's no like exposition so everything has to be dialogue so as a, for a writer like me it's very good training to to think about how to drive the story along just using dialogue which i'm finding very interesting um but it, yeah it's the first chapters out there's only four of these at the moment so check out my linkedin and i'll, I'll send some links to you you can see it. it's good fun it's very and similar Rupert, to rate yeah it's very similar to radio writing in that every 10 words has to drive the narrative forward so it's uh, actually it's you're different. a writer so can give us some advice leo on writing good dialogue let's just have an aside on on that well i think writing a good thousand word piece is, is very different from writing a 240 word 240 200 character tweet or a 10 word story um adapting to the short form is, is something that i've I did not get it instantly. If you go back to, I think our first culture three tweet was sometime in June, no, July 6th, I reckon. Um, I think our, our first like intro tweet is pinned on our profile, culture three dot X, Y, Z. Um, and it's so bad. It's <sighs> such a bad thread. Don't ever look at your old stuff. It's the worst. Like I, I look at, but old you also stuff see how far you've come. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Um, that's true. but yeah, no, you, <gasps> and you, I think I just became more ruthless in cutting things and being concise in just focusing on things that are interesting new for the reader and are driving the narrative forward and focusing less on um sort of just description and the other thing is focusing on things that are, a reader is going to learn from or something they can earn money from or something that they can they can yearn like a lot of people just do i made 10 billion dollars trading crypto punks or whatever i think thinking about those three things learning earning yearning has helped me have had a bit of focus with the writing really short form, form stuff at least on twitter how's your short form game jeremy these days uh so I, i've had an interesting exercise in this just with my with my music background but also with my writing background so initially when i got into like making music for ads this was like 15 20 years ago i was a songwriter i would make songs but now i was being asked to, to generate a very similar emotional response in 30 seconds or 45 seconds. And then you get into sonic identities where you have to do it in seven seconds. So how do you do it compelling in seven seconds? You have to have frameworks, just like Leo mentioned, um, that, uh, what was it? The, the learn, yearn, and what was it? The last um, one? Earn. I, I love that. Mm -hmm. Just having just a simple moniker that kind of keeps you, keeps you tight. And we always say at my good friend, another music producer and um, a partner in Tune Welders, my company, mm -hmm always says don't bore us get to the chorus right so it's kind of like <laughs> yeah very true mm -hmm. yeah he yeah. doesn't like yes <laughs> yeah yes and craft work uh are, are <laughs> not uh even though i like both of them do not get to the chorus <laughs> ever <laughs> awesome um yeah sorry um go ahead. Do, do you want to um, I could, I could have one more question before we speak about the charity work, and that's kind of about the culture of Web3 at large. And mm -hmm. I know that um, DGen culture has even become a cliche now, so I don't want to talk about that. But 
culture three is doing something quite I mean, for me, as I use it as a writing platform to kind of get better at writing, to kind of channel my inner kind of Joan Didion and become like a really great writer. Have you found the reaction to this? What is, I don't know how to describe the writing, but a high level of writing by the DJ community on Twitter. Have they embraced it? Has it changed? How do they, how are they reacting to the content? Is everything changing around the content of all of the, do you understand what I mean with that question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's certainly more to Web3 than DJ and culture. Like, for example, Blur trades 60 to $70 million a day, but it's only 50 wallets that are doing it. There are thousands of people in Web3 and maybe 10% of them, 5%. They might be loud on Twitter, but there's many more people. Um, but, it's all, but they're also connected in that often trading profits come through to more culturally significant things but the aim uh, and so they're related i think the meme stuff as well is is interesting as well because it plays into culture but the aim for culture three has always been focusing on things of significant cultural integrity not just stuff that's been pumped on twitter stuff that actually means something stuff that i can really justify to so someone asked, why have you done this article? This is a, like a stupid thing. And if that person isn't in Web3, I want to be able to justify it to them and have something interesting to say about it. Um, and that doesn't rule out sort of PFP projects and things like that, but it does rule out some of the pretty bad ones. So we've had really interesting apes, punks, whatever, on our, on like, that we've done interviews with. Um, but not all of it is interesting. We've really tried to focus on stuff. Cultural integrity has really been the big word. The other phrase I think about a lot is stuff that is almost evergreen to an extent, stuff that I can look back on in five years and think maybe there's still insight in this, or maybe it just shows that we really knew where this space was evolving, but really focusing on things that are going to last that I can justify and just is reasonably optimistic about the future and I'll say it again, has that integrity to it. I think those are the sorts of things that that we prioritize. And when we launched, we launched in May, June, whatever, um, which was about a couple of weeks after Terra collapsed. So there was a massive drop in that DGen stuff anyway. And I think we came in at a time when people wanted stuff that was of high integrity, that was really emotionally fulfilling and meaningful. And it's very easy to say, to sort of turn around and say, yeah, we, we, this was a great situation coming in just after the, after the crash. Um, maybe it would have been easier to, to launch when Twitter was awash with, with Web3 hashtags and things and Web3 bots. Um, but we came in at a time when that's, that era has felt like it was passing us forever. And I think, we, I think to an extent, we really did tap into people wanting stuff that was different wanting content that you're proud of and were really fulfilled by as well nice 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 yeah so quick shouts to some guys in the chat gabriel was the first one in in today good to good to see you in the chat and we actually have miraculously both rich Tella and tom gillespie in the chat how does that work uh, it, was, like, it, was, that work? it was the solar flare thing that happened today <laughs> that uh ended up making all of that work so good to see everybody um, along the lines of that last discussion point there, Leo, what, uh, there's a question that always is at the ready in my head when someone presents me with a, with a project or an idea that uses web three tech, whether it's, whether it's blockchain, whether it's blockchain plus, uh, CG modeling, 3d game engines, all of that kind of stuff. I always ask, you know, at least in my head, sometimes externally, does this even need blockchain? Does this execution, is this execution more complicated by blockchain or enhanced by blockchain? Have you had similar, what are your thoughts on that? I think it's a really important question to ask. Um, not only because like putting something on the blockchain, is just difficult. Like Ethereum only has, um, oh, I can't quite remember the, the number, um, like a few hundred gigabytes of data on it. You can buy a hard drive from Amazon to store all of the data on Ethereum for $50. So like, putting something on the blockchain is, is a massive hassle for one, um, but it's also just been a hype thing for the past couple of years. Uh, not so much these days, but it is a hype thing. I think it's a really important question to us. Definitely the question that I ask quite a lot when I'm thinking, 
of articles that we might be running on Culture 3. Do you really need a blockchain for this? Um, and, and yeah, sometimes things don't. I think sort of I spent a while talking about art and commerce. I think there are real good reasons to put stuff on blockchain there. I think there are loads of really interesting use cases. Um, sort of a couple of years, like NFC ticketing is the one I talk about loads. Um, couple like in terms of real estate, the UK government did a pilot program that took the time it takes just to transfer a property from 22 weeks doing it on blockchain, brought it down to 10 minutes. So there are, there are really interesting use cases from every sort of place in, in life, culture, commerce, society, or whatever. Um, and also many things that, that don't, but I think it's a really important question to ask for sure. Yeah, the the legal transaction piece of the puzzle, specifically related to real estate. I mean, I've I've been through a couple of sales just on my my old houses or whatever, and you know, it's amazing the paper involved. Number one, but also like the fact that it's still we're still doing this thing. Some things like like Tom said in the chat, paper is great. I've got my notebook right here. I love writing with a pencil, but like when paper gets digital, people get a little nervous about like, okay, is that thing editable? Is this like and then you know change control and then in a moment in time you lock in that that asset with that particular uh, arrangement of combinations of added to it right so that's that's interesting uh to me like you mentioned on the land side uh real estate side could be could be a fun one yeah for sure i think the furthest sort of that example i mentioned is a british one but um I think the place that's taken its furthest is a city called South Burlington. I think it's in Vermont. City of fifteen thousand people, um, and all of the all of the properties are on chain, just because it makes it you can avoid fraud. It just transfers much quicker because a lot of what, like in terms of that fraud thing, a lot of people try and fake stuff and like pretend they have a property when they don't. Um, and I think the other. Th the other side is that a lot of people trust the government to handle these things. Anyway, they're not, they're not really aware of how their property deed actually works. Um, I think a lot of blockchain stuff will happen just on the back end behind the scenes. Real estate will be one of many examples of that. Um, I think that's the way that, that at least real estate and many other sectors will, will adopt. That's a really good point. So think about like titles and deeds and all of those pieces of paper that you sign that nobody reads when you sell a house or a i mean <laughs> not nobody reads but you know um but you get through this thing and it's like do i want to look into that more and and become more involved with those pieces and parts or am i okay with just it being this centralized organization covering so this goes back to like do we really want to do we really want to be decentralized as a society or do we want to have someone to point the finger to and say this guy messed up my thing you know hey credit card company you know you guys mess just having a throat to choke right are people ready to be their own throat chokers that's it no i don't I, th I think that the whole world that we live in in the past couple of hundred years has become such a fantastic thing. Obviously the world isn't perfect, but it's better than it's ever been before. It's arisen because people have specialized in different things. People have specialized in signing legal contracts and writing legal contracts and selling houses and whatever. And to ask people to suddenly stop trusting other people and to do all of that themselves is, I think is a little bit crazy when you think of it like that it's really trying to reverse centuries of specialization that has made people at least in the west wealthy many people in the east very wealthy and is what for poorer countries in the world is what will make them wealthy in the future um i think it's crazy to ask people to to become their own throat chokers um i think a lot of where blockchain will succeed in terms of adoption is when people who are already specialists in this sort of thing, and it's the same with AI as well, um, people who are already specialists in selling your house and in, in whatever, in creating something, are going to integrate it into their back end to make it better when that's appropriate. <coughs> A lot of subtext in Jeremy's uh, observations today. Yeah, <laughs> very chunky. <laughs> yeah, we've got to keep the narrative interesting, right? We're all, we're all. We're all on that storyteller train. Well, so okay. I think that's a nice, a nice segue then talking about the East and the West and the poor countries finding a way. 
I know that you've you're, you're, you've done a recent report on philanthropy and Web3 and charities and how, from what you said and what I've seen, there isn't really anything like it out there. So anyone who's listening, who's interested in charity and Web3, they should uh, read it. There's a link on my profile. We'll put one in when we do our show notes. Um, could you explain about the report a little bit and what is what are the opportunities for philanthropists and charities in Web3? Yeah, sure. Um, topic a lot. I think it's a really it's been a really interesting topic to be researching and writing about um, over the past what four months. Um, basically, what it is is a forty-four page report on, as you as you say, what charities can do in Web3. It's at culture3.xyz forward slash insight. Um, and yeah, no, it was fantastic to to do it. We did it with Save the Children, with Water Aid, um, some Web3 people as well, World of Women, um, which is a really interesting PFP collection. <coughs> um, but I think we split it into three sections in terms of what Web3 actually offers. Sections about community, about money, and about information. And really what we were focusing on when we were approaching these sections was what, what, what can you do with blockchain? What can you do with NFTs? How can you, how can you do stuff in a better way than you're already doing before? Um, the community side is really interesting. I think for every, pretty much every organization in the world should really be thinking about how can I make my customers or my donors feel like they are part of this company's mission or this charity's mission. There's so much that you can do with NFTs to welcome people into a community and to to gate that community with a, with that token, and then you can do you know kind of normal marketing stuff and engage them in ways that that marketers are probably quite used to doing. Um, but you can use NFTs to really to create that sense of community. We've seen it happen in quite a few different sort of main like huge organizations like one example is man united football club that released their nfts a couple of months ago they've done some really clever things in terms of basically airdropping you you interesting stuff to make you feel like you belong to this organization and i think charities can lean into that more than most because their mission is so obviously empowering the mission of man united football club is to is to score goals the mission of save the children is to save the freaking children and the people that they can reach are so passionate about this work that they're doing about what water aid is doing to to bring clean water and thus life itself and all the prosperity that can come from that to to people that don't have a clean glass of water to drink I think it's there's such an empowering mission there that you can use NFTs to build a community around. That's a lot of what we're talking about when we have these when we're having these conversations with those charities. The second one is just money. Um, I, we had a great quote from a one charity that we interviewed, which was charities have are worried about nine hundred different revenue streams. Sort of they don't have this this one sales channel that. Man United or LVMH or whoever might have, they just need money. And obviously, and blockchain is a very financialized sector. Is there's a lot of sort of money, sort of one of the first things that we think about. Um, and in terms of donations, there's absolutely sort of you should charities should definitely be thinking about how they can access crypto donations. Already, probably two two thousand charities are accepting crypto donations as big as Save the Children. Save the Children's been accepting Bitcoin since 2013. Like a lot of these charities are much further ahead than other organizations, but others are, are not. And that's a really important dynamic because we live in such a global marketplace for charities and an audience that is increasingly digital and increasingly is just going to go to those charities, even if they're the other side of the world. You need to be competing with with so many more charities to really stand out. Um, so crypto donations is something that is probably the, probably the first thing to think about, um, but also money just in terms of how you distribute it as well by sending money to, to, to West Africa or something. It's much sort of Western Union or whoever are going to charge a, a major fee if you can do that over the blockchain and pay 0.1% or something, that's saving lots of money. 
Um, one great example is World Food Program, who have been doing stuff on blockchain since 2017. They save millions of dollars in fees and in payments and in whatever that can have a tangible impact on their programs because they're doing stuff within it with um with with uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, USDC, um, which had a bit of a bubble over the weekend, but looks like that's fine. And the third thing is money. Sort of just like you can share, you can send money over the blockchain, you can have better information sharing, better transparency as well that facilitates that collaboration. I mentioned, mentioned World Food Program. Their operations in Jordan and Lebanon are coordinated much better with UN and other organizations that are local to just share information to make sure that, for example, refugees traveling through that region get cared for in a better way because there's more information available on the blockchain about what is actually happening on the ground. Um, so I think those three things, community to really engage your donors, money to, to just become more efficient in terms of how you raise and how you spend, and information just to facilitate greater transparency, which donors are, donors are increasingly looking for. I think those three things are the, the main themes that we found in our research that, that were really interesting. Fascinating. That's awesome. Yeah. The one thing I always thought about with, with charity applications of, of Web3 is you, you have this community of people that really care about a cause, right? And you have, have means to create transactions that are not just monetary, that are uh, almost barter system uh, driven, right? Where, you know, if I'm if my superpower is, I don't know, say filmmaking, right? Or shooting content, Marx is, is a writer, we're part of your charity. Now, like through like a DAO structure or through some form or fashion, we could have, uh, I always call it our superpowers encapsulated, right? So we could be, our superpowers could be applied in service to the nonprofit. And maybe there's some sort of return that, that comes with that, whether it's reputation based or giveaway stuff, but not necessarily monetary. Uh, Cause there, there's a history of that. There's, there was a cruise line. Uh, we actually ended up doing some music stuff for like, eight or 10 years ago related to people would get on these cruises, but they would cruise to some place where they would rebuild the village or, you know, would do something really, really interesting like this work hard, play hard. My buddy, Sean did the similar version after Katrina in new Orleans, where he got us all on a bus and we rebuilt houses in the old fourth war, but then we went to jazz fest right afterwards. So there, there's a, there's, I think there's a desire for people to be deeper, more deeply connected with the charities they support. Couldn't this be a great, uh, way to make that happen? Absolutely. That like char charitable tourism. You have to be careful with the messaging now. Totally. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I've just seen the comments on the side saying the best design of charity would be a cult. Um, which, <laughs> which I think there's, so, I think there's some truth in that. There's a great essay called, uh, after authenticity by a guy called Toby Shoren. Um, which has changed my thinking on cults quite a lot. Um, but they're definitely, definitely can be good. Um, but yeah, in terms and yeah, should be lent into. Otherwise, cults just get a bad name and that would be unfair. Um, but yeah. That's two weeks this, running where we've been bigging up cults, Jeremy. There's a, there's a, there's a through line coming. Uh, we yeah. don't know where it's going yet. <laughs> Stay tuned, everybody. Um, but yeah. Sort of the big thing that's exciting about what you can do with blockchain is that word that you mentioned, Jeremy, reputation. And the work that you do can be on chain in terms of sort of you've contributed this. And it might not be contributing money. It might be contributing a like a um like some media, some footage or some some music or or even some sort of insight on thinking, some strategy. Sort of you can the charity can basically put something on the blockchain that says, you know, like a reference that you get at the bottom of a LinkedIn profile. I mean, it depends how hard you're grinding on LinkedIn. I don't have many. Um, but something that says we verify that Jeremy has produced this fantastic piece of work. And that as well as being sort of reputation as we existing, as we use it today can also facilitate, I would imagine other use cases that we might speculate about and others that we can't even imagine Like we talked about airdropping quite a lot sort of if those, those relationships between charity and volunteer are something that are really provable, then I imagine we'll see a lot more people leaning on that to, to airdrop stuff and to share things. Um, and I think there are probably loads of other opportunities that, 
that will be pretty common in the next five years that we can't even think of today as well. One quick thing on the airdrop piece is, you know, everyone associates that with the, you know, kind of the previous phase of the NFT boom and quasi busts and, and all mm -hmm. of that, right? But, yep. but what the tech behind an airdrop can do is let you respond very quickly uh, to a targeted group of people. The connection's already yeah. built. It's already mm -hmm. made. You don't have to go through your email list. You have to go, well, hey, I've got this audience who does this and this guy does that. It's this automated procedure. When you have an opportunity as a um, uh, as a nonprofit to reward a very specific hyper-focused niche of your community, you can do it really quickly with this. And I think that is very compelling. Um, I would agree yeah. with you. Yeah. Yeah, I agree too. Awesome. Well, guys, we are, in, we are in- tokens. Yeah. Yeah, we're at time or approaching it, guys. Do do we have time for the our 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 quick hits? Do you want to do you want to land some quick hits on them, Mark? Um, yeah, just first, we're on the debate team at Oxford, Leo. You, you you speak very well. No, I wasn't on the debate team. I wasn't. People on the debate team spend too much time debating and not enough time doing. Okay, <laughs> so uh, yeah, a couple of quick fire questions: yes or no, or some other answer. Um, community or utility? Community. Uh, code is law, yes or no? Oh, no. No people. Norms. Yeah. <laughs> uh, apes or punks? Apes. I like the storytelling. Fiction or non-fiction? I have to go non-fiction, but that's a tough one. Ethereum or Bitcoin? Oh, ETH. Yeah, um, <laughs> reggae, heavy metal, or drum and bass? <laughs> oh, uh, I'll go for reggae. Again, yes. I think reggae is winning four to zero to zero. Awesome. Um, thank you. Amazing, Leo. Such a such a pleasure connecting with you, and and I've, I I can't wait to dive deeper into this. Uh, this paper that you guys just produced related to the nonprofits. I'm going to do an even deeper dive and more consistent uh, jumping around in Culture 3. We'll, we'll be sure to post all the links. Uh, what I really love about what you're doing is, is creating this kind of sense-making uh, vehicle for people tipping their toes into this, whether they're, a, they're an artist or a builder or whatever, man. So keep doing, keep doing the good work there. Look forward to staying in touch on that. Um, Mark, always a pleasure. And, can uh, I just say, um, can I just add something there? Apart from Culture 3, best writing in Web3. Um, next week, I'm going to be at Paris Blockchain. So I'll be recording from Paris Blockchain Week. So if any of our listeners are going to be in Paris next week, then look me up. I'll be there every day. You should just set up in a hallway over there and just pull people well, in. Well, yeah, I was thinking I might just, I might do that. I'm going to scope it out when I get there to see how it is. But yeah, maybe something like that. Amazing. Well, th hey, thanks to all the listeners and, um, you know, keep keep coming, keep hanging out. Sorry, we were a little tardy today. We will be more prompt because time will be better ordered in what, a week or so? Mark, is that the deal? Well, yeah, I think, is it? The solar week, flare's over. Awesome. But next week will be the same, no, because we don't put our clocks back until a week Sunday. So next Thursday, we'll have the same issue. Well, now we've, now we've, uh, we're lifelong learners and we've, we've learned something today. So, uh, awesome guys. Not Great to see you. Thanks for that. Listening. Thank you so much uh, for having me on. Take it yeah. easy.